Well, while they're finding my slides, I will tell you that I, um, I got involved with the transhumanists quite a few years ago because I thought, here are a group of really bright young men who are being responsible for the belief system that they have. Um, Mormonism has a lot of uh, strange beliefs uh, about transfiguration and uh, the second coming, all of these kinds of things, and I thought, okay, you can uh, have a belief system that you put the responsibility on somebody else and maybe it'll just appear someday, or you can actually actively get involved with that way of thinking and figure out that that's uh, uh, something that you actually believe and you want to further those beliefs and you want to be uh, responsible for the belief system that you have. And so I thought, okay, there aren't too many people in the Mormon church that really follow through with some of the beliefs that they have. Um, I'm also, I also have to admit that uh, even though I've, I'm a Mormon, I was raised as a Mormon, I'm also a mystic. And I know that there are people in the Mormon transhumanists who are uh, maybe agnostic, might be Buddhist, might be Christians, might be a lot of other religions. And I really appreciate that because um, I think this group is thinking out of the box. And I think when, you, when you're a member of an organization uh, such as a, a Mormon, uh, especially along the Wasatch Front, or you are a uh, Bible Belt Christian or whatever else, you contain your belief systems within the boundaries that Chris was talking about earlier. And the one thing about transhumanism is that it's breaking down the barriers of belief systems. And I think that that's a real important aspect of moving into you know, the next few years, because I think our belief systems and the walls around our belief systems are starting to break, break down. And I think we're becoming more inclusive about how we think about, uh, you know, who we are and what, what we actually believe and what we're willing to put our efforts into. I've been going to India for the last uh, 20 years. I, haven't, I hadn't gone back for a few years this last trip, I, I took a trip last month and I was there for a couple of weeks. And I was amazed at the changes that have happened in India. Um, it's not quite as exotic as it was 20 years ago. There aren't as many elephants, camels, water buffalo walking, you know, kind of pulling things down the roads. But there are um, many, many more problems and many more people. Um, when I first started going to India, there were probably, you know, 800 million people. N now there's over a billion. And um, I'm thinking that the United States has, what, 300, approximately 350 million people? Well, that many people have been born in India since the first time. Okay, let's see. Oh, we've got a visit to India here, right, right when I'm talking about it. Um, I have to say that India is, uh, you, you talk about boundaries of belief systems, boundaries of realities. And if, I, I know some of you have probably been there, but the one thing that you come away from after being in India for a while is realizing that the reality that you thought you knew uh, has expanded and that that reality is not, um, not the solid reality that you thought it was. Uh, anything, it, it seems that almost anything that is possible can exist in India. It is the extreme of everything. It is the extreme of beauty, of uh, 
of the opposite also. It is uh, the extreme of um, wealth and poverty. It is the extreme of the very finest and the very worst. You just, you walk away expanding what you thought could be possible on planet Earth. Um, I spent some time in the slums of Delhi this time. Uh, as I mentioned before, the population of India has increased uh, since I started going there as much as the whole population of the United States. It has over a billion people in a, in a land mass that's maybe a third the size of the United States. Um, the people are brilliant. <clears throat> you probably work with people from India. Uh, this is, um, I, I would say, on, an inside of a slum, and it's fairly clean. Uh, the slums that I went to um, this last time were overwhelmingly um, problematic, and I just felt like, what is going on? How? What is the future of the people who live in these slums? There are. Um, in Delhi alone, there are 20, um, I want to, sometimes when I'm talking, I get my figures wrong, but there are 20 million people in De Delhi. And so uh, I would say 20% of those people live in the slums. So you've got um, 4 million people living in these in circumstances like this in one city. Now, India has like, you know, at, at least three and maybe four cities that are close to 20 million people the size of Delhi. And they all have huge slums. Um, I've spent some time in Mumbai and the slums there. Um, Calcutta is an incredible city. And then just across the border, you've got Bangladesh with Dhaka, that is a, another city of 20 million people with huge slums. So when we talk about the quality of life and we qual uh, the quality of life that we expect, um, the, the planet Earth is, become, is shrinking and we're becoming a global society. And we may not think that we have to deal with other parts of the world, but we really do. And I think it's pretty apparent now as we look at the problems on the other side of the planet that we're not going to avoid um, the problems of other countries, of other cultures, of you know what what we can't, what we think we can do nothing about. Um, this is uh, not a great photo, as, <laughs> but it's a little girl who. It's typical of the kids that you see in the slums and in India, and they always are smiling. They are always happy, and you wonder how can they be happy living in this garbage? And uh, I just think um, they really need to. Uh, people around here need to really, really be grateful for the wonderful air that we breathe, the, the beautiful uh, conditions that we have around us. Uh, these boys look happy now. They're faced with a lifetime of problems. Um, many of them will commit crimes when they get older. There's so much corruption in India that when you have that many people living in slum conditions, you're going to end up with a lot of problems. Uh, this is a little village I visited in Chandigarh. Chandigarh is in the is in the middle of the Indus Valley. It's uh, it's uh, the beginning of civilization. It's ten thousand years old. That civilization goes back ten thousand years. We go back what not a little over one hundred and fifty years in, in this area. So you can imagine. You talk about the depth of culture, the depth of the arts uh, that exist there, and yet the problems are just overwhelming. This is a little uh, Anganwada, which is kind of a government-based little preschool that uh, allows children to get some education. Um, the problem in this area is gender equality. And you've heard that there's so many young uh, children um, 
or I should say there are, there are 75 girls born to every 100 boys born in this particular area and other parts of the world because of gender inequality. And there's so many problems associated with raising girls, um, of being a girl that at least 25% are aborted before they're even born. These are girls who um, are obviously in a pretty good school in Delhi. Um, they're well, being well educated and they have a future if they're educated. If they do not have an education, um, they are um, either married off at a very, very young age, uh, 25,000 girls under the age of 18 are married worldwide. They have a future of poverty and servitude and really, really poor health, and, and it's pretty obvious in India. Um, this is an intern from the University of Utah assisting one of the NGOs that I'm working with in Delhi. And we're feeding, the photo didn't come through too good, but there, she's feeding um, a group of widows, and widows, uh, are kind of thrown out basically after their husband dies or when they get older and there's no one there to take care of them. Their whole, their families, it's so traditional and it goes back for so many years that um, they really um, are <laughs> underappreciated and neglected. And so this group that I'm working with is really trying to help. Uh, it's too bad some of these didn't come through very good. The, this is another widow. These are some children from the slums who are happy. Like I said, they, uh, they're just the smartest, greatest kids in the world, and yet they, are so, they have so little um, opportunities at this point. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Delhi slum, and I, I wanted this particular picture especially because you can't see it, but the girl behind the blue balloon is wearing a princess dress. Now, I don't know where she got the princess dress, but everybody has a, a daughter or a niece or somebody who you know has been wearing a princess dress the last couple of years almost every time. So it's the same thing uh, happens in India. These little girls... They want to be princesses, and they want the best uh, that is available to them, but they have so little opportunity. So I know that um, we can't all go to India. We can't all help in, in a physical way, but we can know what the problem is. We can use our technology. We can use our education. We can be supportive in so many ways to help educate and to help um, some of the situations in some of the developing countries that are right on our borders. Um, I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to. But if anybody has a question, I'll answer it at this point. Okay. All righty.